tonight. I will be reviewing, as I promised, Meat Cleaver Massacre. Another really cool name for a VHS for a movie. Also known by the alternate theatrical title, Hollywood Meat Cleaver Massacre. Now that title actually has more to do with the movie than the shortened title in the VHS, Meat Cleaver Massacre, because it actually does take place in Hollywood, but there's neither a meat cleaver nor a massacre in this movie. That's a very interesting thing. Um, it actually sh even shows a meat cleaver on the package, on the box. So, I don't know. They're just trying to make money off the Texas Chainsaw Massacre thing. So, as you can see, we've got Catalina Home Video. And they released early on in the 80s. This one, this VHS, like I said, is 1983. And the box, all the Catalina Home Video boxes have this kind of grid pattern on it. With just a simple theatrical poster. You can actually buy the poster online. Well, I don't know if you can now, but I've seen it on eBay before. And it would only go for like 20 bucks, not much. But as you can see, the post is not anything exciting anyway. It's just, um, well, it has a little bit to do with the story. You got a guy in a stretcher. The guy's in a coma. And a weird looking hand thing, like a spirit hand. And you got four guys at the fingertips with stockings on their face. So that goes with the story. But uh, it looks like there's like this weird claw thing coming out of the thumb. I just never understood what that was. And then you got the meat cleaver behind them. I don't know why they put the meat cleaver on there. I guess it's just to make you think it's a slasher movie. Okay, Catalina Home Video. Like I said, they released some other titles. I have another one here, Alligator. This one is, because they have catalog numbers on the spine, this is CHV01. Catalina Home Video, number one. This is number seven. This one is surrounded on all sides and opens from the side. This one slides right out the bottom. This VHS recently sold on eBay for I think about $56, $60, which I was surprised. I bought this at a buy it now on eBay probably like five or six years ago for $20. And I was pretty excited about that because even then it went for like 30 bucks. So that was cool. I was like one of the first people who viewed it. So I snatched it up and I was really happy because at the time I was trying to get every movie with Massacre in it. And Meat Cleaver Massacre just sounds really cool. So there's a lot of contro no, well, not controversy, but there's a big problem with this movie because, as you can see on the theatrical poster, it says Christopher Lee as the host. And what happened was Christopher Lee filmed these segments for another production company for another movie. The production company of that film ended up not making the movie, so they sold the footage to this production company that made this movie. And what they did, this, pr this production company, they just slapped on the Christopher Lee intro and outro right onto this movie. And when Christopher, Christopher Lee found out that they started to advertise this movie as hosted by Christopher Lee, he was super pissed. He took the producers to court and everything. The movie starts off immediately with Christopher Lee like telling us his story about spirits and just these weird little spirit stories that seem totally irrelevant to the actual movie, which is which makes sense because it wasn't filmed for this movie. Um, the movie is about uh, this professor, he's like a professor in demonology or mythology or whatever, and he just has this little scuffle with one of the students, and this student is like part of this gang of friends, like five friends, and it's kind of weird, they all wear triangles on their sleeve, I don't know what the deal is with that, but one night the friends are getting drunk, getting wasted, and they want to do something crazy, so they go to the professor's house. And I don't know how they know where he lives, but they just end up driving there drunk, and they finally get there. And they put these caps on, these like uh, stockings over their head. The lead guy's name, his name was Mason, or Mace, they call him. And he wanted to kill the professor most of all. The other guys just thought, oh, we we're just going to go there and mess with him and, and, you know, beat him up or whatever. But he ends up killing the professor. The other guys kind of get worried, like, oh, what's going on? And then they realize they have to kill the whole family. They get all killed, and... Well, the killings aren't even that good. The professor gets, like, bonked on the head. Well, he doesn't die, but we'll get to that in a second. He gets bonked on the head with, like, a candlestick. And the daughter is, like, stabbed in the stomach. So you're seeing her getting stabbed in the stomach. But all of a sudden, she has her face is drenched in blood. So I, I don't really don't understand how the whole that blood got on her face when she was just being stabbed in the stomach a couple of times. So that was weird. And the son is killed by, you know, one of the friends in the gang. He grabs, like, a cord off the counter. Now, I don't know. It's just a random cord right on the counter. He just took it off. I don't know why anyone would have a random cord on their counter. He strangles the, um, the son. And that's it. And they kill the wife. I forget how they kill the wife. So the professor lives, right? So he's in the hospital in a coma. 
and the whole family's dead, and he's paralyzed from the neck down, he can't speak, and all this just from being hit in the head, back of the head with a candlestick. So he's laying there in the bed, can't talk, can't move or anything, but somehow he summons demons. Because he is a professor of demonology, he summons a demon called Morak. This weird, I don't know, some ancient demon, I don't know if it's a real demon or not, but he summons Morak to, to kill the guys who killed his family, and one by one they each get knocked off. The one guy runs to the desert just to hang out because he's stressed by the whole killing a whole family thing, so he goes to the desert to relax, but then you start hearing whispers like, I summon Morak. Kill them, Morak, which is supposed to be the professor talking to the demon. So the guy is running around the desert scared for his life, and then we just cut to him with slash marks on his stomach or whatever. So that was one death, and another one of the guys in the Gang of Friends is a car mechanic, and he's under the hood doing some work, and you start to hear the creepy voices again, the professor saying, I summon Morak or whatever, and... All of a sudden, the hood of the car keeps slamming down his head repeatedly, and he just died. While this whole thing is going on, there's like this detective, like this little subplot, which is very minimal. I don't even know if you want to even call it a subplot. The detective is going around trying to make a link between these cases, and he finally links that these deaths are related to the death of the entire family of the professor. So he goes to the head guy of the gang, whatever, with the triangles. I don't know, we're really stupid, but... And... He sets up the scenario to Mason saying, okay, I got these two things. Either you were involved with the murders, or your friends were involved in the murders, or maybe the professor summoned demons to kill your friends, which is kind of weird that he would just think of this out of the blue. Mason eventually falls for the trick and goes to the professor's house to find the paperwork showing how to break the curse. And who's waiting there but the detective. So the detective sees Mason like, aha, I got you. And Mason, he kills the detective by bonking him on the head with the same candlestick he killed the professor with, or knocked unconscious. After that, it's just Mason run away from this beast. And we finally get to see this demon thing. And it's the most ridiculous sight. It's just... It looks like the swamp thing. It's just a guy with... It looks like he has seaweed or, or like, fur. It's just, like, this really stupid image. You would expect something, like, really grisly, dark, and twisted. No, it just looks like a guy covered in, in clumps of hair and, like, seaweed. It was just really weird and laughable and not scary. So, he... So, that swamp creature demon thing ends up, like, messing up Mason. And Mason ends up in a psychiatric hospital. You see him in a rubber room, and that's it. And then we cut straight to Christopher Lee again, back into this weird demon office thing that he's in, and telling us another story about this um, Indian tribe spirit. I don't know. It was just a weird story, and it feels like we just cut to the credits without him even finishing the story. He doesn't even say, okay, thank you for watching, or whatever. He just tells his story, and it seems like right in the middle of it, we just cut to the credits, and that's it. And that is, in a nutshell, Meet Cleaver Massacre, or Hollywood Meet Cleaver Massacre, and there's also other titles online. Um, let's see, now, everyone involved with this movie, really, I mean, the actors and actresses, they're just nobodies. Most of them didn't even play in another movie. The director never directed another movie. The producer, well, one of the producers produced some other stuff, like recent stuff. One of them was, like, the documentary of Real Snuff or whatever, which is this really bad, fake, mockumentary thing. So he's still making garbage. And the most successful person that was involved with this movie, Me Cleaver Massacre, is the cinematographer, who's done a number of popular shows, uh, did some cinematography for a number of popular shows, like House and, um, I think Silk Stockings and... And other stuff like that, and other a lot of recent television shows. I just can't remember them right now. Um, so that's it. So out of that whole mess of Me Cleaver Massacre, only one person became successful. Not even the director. He never did anything else, and that was a cinematographer. So I don't know. That's Me Cleaver Massacre. It's put together fairly well. It's just a really bad story. Um, I don't know what else to say about it except that it has a really cool but misleading name. Very kind of lame box art, but it's as lame as the movie, so this has been Paul with SlasherIndex.com